Hi, this is Melissa Nash with Checkmark Collections. Have you heard about Reg F yet? Well, you're about to. We've put together a series featuring seven short videos aimed at topics that are most relevant to the creditor, you. We're going to cover items such as call frequency and communication caps, itemization dates, information needed in the validation notice, and so forth. These issues are important to you as the creditor, and they're definitely important to us as the collection agency. If you have any questions after these videos, please feel free to reach out to me or one of your account executives in the office, and we'll be glad to answer any of your questions. At Checkmark Collections, we always put the check back into your business. So uh, Michael and I are going to talk a little bit about time bar debt. And there was some speculation that Regulation F might contain some real specific language on what uh, agency ought to include in those types of notices that involve collection of a debt that may be time barred. That ended up not happening. Um, what, uh, what the rule does say which is not really much different than what the case law has said for a while, is that collectors should not take or threaten any legal action on a debt where under state law, the statute of limitations has expired. Um, so uh, you can't sue on it. You can't send a note or make a call saying, we're going to sue on this debt when you know it's time barred. It's not just if you know it's time barred, I believe it's if you should have known it's time barred. And the, you know, the difficulty in the time barred debt uh, issue to me is that there's nothing in the FDCPA or the regs that say, you know, you've got X number of years on a consumer debt or you have to act within so long a period. You're looking at the underlying state law. So that can give rise to a host of uh, complicated issues. What within a state, what what law applies? Uh, did you have a written contract or, or or was it a verbal contract? That can make a big difference. Uh, does the does the date of last payment re-trigger the statute? And then sometimes, what state law even applies? Uh, you might have a, a debtor. Uh, crossing state lines to see somebody uh, get a service. You might have a contractual choice of law clause that uh, maybe unwittingly puts an agency into a situation of applying a state law other than the one in which there's, they assume would be applied. So once again, this issue uh, creates a need for some close communication between the creditor and the collector in terms of what the status of the debt is, what the payments were, what law applies, what contracts exist, and, uh, and, and a lot of effort needs to be put in to make sure you're treating accounts the same way and, cons and consistently. One of the things that, uh, to me, biggest takeaway for a creditor is do what you can to get your accounts to your agencies as soon as possible. Uh, you shouldn't be waiting until these debts are up against the statute of limitations. I know there's times when you know you, it can't be avoided, but this, the the earlier you can get it to the uh, agencies, you're going to number one eliminate this issue, but number two, you're also going to have a consumer that has hopefully still a recollection about the debt that they owe to you, and it's going to be a little easier. But as Chris indicated, this is an issue where ordinarily the FDCPA trumps. Uh, law and says it is the law of the land, except for it's kind of a reverse trump in that it says if a state law is more specific, the state law will trump the FDCPA. So in this particular area with statute of limitations, why it's so important is you know, it's actually very straightforward and that you can't imply, you can't threaten, you can't sue on an out-of-statute debt but then you have to look at the state law to see is it out of statute. So that's where it becomes tricky, and, and frankly, the, 
The thing that the creditor needs to help the agency with, as Chris mentioned, is really getting to that date uh, to where the statute of limitations has started ticking. Uh, that's a very important date. Uh, all these things are going to start dovetailing with things like itemization date and, and things like that with respect to a reg F. The, uh, there's been, like I mentioned, there's been an, uh, quite a bit of case law on this issue over the last, I don't know, five or ten years. Um, and, and I think that the rule is pretty consistent with that. But as Michael said, it, it doesn't have to be an explicit threat. It doesn't have to be in black and white. We are going to sue you tomorrow if you don't pay this. There, there are many letters that, you know, you can tell that they're drafted in a way that we're trying not to make an explicit threat, but then again, we're trying to encourage that uh, consumer to pay, so we're going to try to get as close to the line as we can in, in talking about, you know, remedies or, or, or we're going to have to go to the next step or, or what have you, and there's no end to the creativity that we've seen amongst consumer lawyers in trying to parse that language and, and interpret it and encourage the federal court or, this, or, or whoever's uh, uh, presiding over that FDCPA claim can be in state court, that that letter should be interpreted in a way that it went too close to the line. And, you know, when you have those kind of situations, uh, you, do, you do, again, run the risk of uh, class action type of claims because typically it's been done, you know, hundreds or thousands of times a, a letter is sent out. And typically you're talking about a larger group of consumers who are in the same bucket, unless it just happens to be a glitch and that, you know, the, the agency thought they had a batch of accounts that were all within however many years and something slipped in. So there again, uh, we we've mentioned it before, but the the bona fide error defense becomes very important, and that's where creditors and collectors can really help one another out. If you have written documentation where you're agreeing upon the kind of accounts that are going to be sent, uh, maybe you agree upon these older accounts they're not going to be sent, or they're going to be flagged in such a way that we can identify those as accounts that are treated differently, that are not given the standard talk-offs or the standard follow-up letters or maybe even the standard credit reporting. It's, it, you know, beyond the statute of limitations, of course, there are limits in how long uh, you can uh, report an account to a credit bureau. There's some other interesting things that happen and, and you know, the creditors, from the creditor standpoint, if your debt is created in Wisconsin, if your debt is created, I think it's Mississippi, and then I, uh, I think North Carolina is one other that's if it's a debt buyer that purchases the debt. Those three states say that once the statute of limitations is passed, the debt is extinguished. So it's really important uh, to, again, think about all these different state laws and for the creditors uh, to work closely with uh, the agencies on those types of issues. And it gets, you can keep going down this rabbit hole when it comes to time barred debt. That's why, again, I recommend you know, get these accounts out as quickly as you can so you don't run into these issues. But in Minnesota, uh, they adopted a statute several years ago that expressly applies to consumer debt. That basically says uh, if you make a payment on an on a out-of-statute consumer debt, it does not revive the statute of limitations. And that was a change. Legal aid uh, worked with that. The attorney general worked with that. Uh, but in effect, it, it basically creates an, an out, if you will, for a, a consumer to pay on a debt and not worry about reviving the statute on it. That sometimes can get lost uh, on creditors, sometimes can get lost on collection agencies. Uh, so you know, think about all of that, and maybe what you can do is to work with your agencies uh, to come up with, you know, what are your protocols, uh, joint protocols to make sure that we aren't uh, running into these risks without a statute debt. Just to, just to uh, add one other point to, to what what Michael mentioned about the reviving the statute. There was a situation a few years ago in which um, regulatory action resulted in a consent decree in which a collector agreed that going, I can't remember if it was a creditor or collector, but going forward, 
they would include some specific information in notices for time barred debt that indeed uh, it was time barred or that you know a, a payment in the future could uh, you know pose a risk that the the uh, that would revive the statute of limitations. So that is a theory that I've seen in current class action cases where consumer attorneys have picked up on that and said, well, there really ought to be, to really be clear to under the FDCPA to be not misleading and to, to be accurate and understood by the least sophisticated debtor, there ought to be that kind of affirmative disclosure. That's again, that's not in the CFPB rule. The, the regulation F. That's not there, but it doesn't stop some uh, lawyers from asserting that it should be there. And uh, it's kind of strange to me because it starts getting into the realm of, you know, if I'm a collector, I feel like I'm giving legal advice to the consumer. And, and I think, as I mentioned before, these are not necessarily easy issues to sort through. Uh, there are good faith arguments that can often be made on both sides as to what statute of limitations applies. Is it is it time barred or not? Uh, is it a written contract sufficient under the statute to have an extended time frame under that state's law? There's a host of issues that sometimes can be used to, um, you know, avoid a class being certified. But uh, they're not all solved by Regulation F. But I think uh, they, the CFPB has certainly flagged the issue as, as one that's important, and I'm sure there's going to be further litigation in the years ahead. Yeah, and a couple other comments uh, that Chris just was mentioning. The CFPB, again, did not mandate uh, disclosure about time-barred debt. In fact, they, there is some commentary in the rules that talk about uh, they decided that was, as Chris was mentioning, kind of hard and expensive to make sure you get this right. So they are not specifying uh, language uh, with respect to that issue. That isn't always the, the end of the question, and end of the issue, because there are some state laws that require some specific language on time barred debt. Uh, the other thing that, you know, if, if you're working with your agencies and are reviewing letters, if that's part of what your uh, relationship is, with respect to you, the creditor, providing settlement authority. You can settle these accounts up to 75 cents on the dollar. Uh, and, and then the agency uses that uh, to negotiate and talks about settlement and puts it in writing and that sort of thing. Those sorts of, that, that use of the word settlement in the context of a uh, debt that's out of statute has been deemed in a bunch of cases to be a violation. That you, uh, in, in effect, it, you can't really settle a out of statute debt. It's just can you kind of, resolve it? You can resolve it. You have to come up with different language. It's a weird uh, sort of you know these conundrums that we get put under these these word games that we play uh, to to kind of work around it. But those are the sorts of things that you need to keep in mind uh, as you're working and, and reviewing your vendors, the agency's letters. Anything else, Chris? I think we've covered the basics. All right. Good luck out there. <laughs>